So I've been writing a couple notes actually as uh, both uh, you guys have been speaking here. And one thing kind of came to my mind, um, kind of a level of consistency in the past two talks, uh, which is that um, the importance of actually making things informs your ability to be able to uh, create better design, right? So um, understanding how something is actually put together really uh, helps you not just be a better designer, but it makes you more engaged with, uh, you know, if we're creating these things called algorithm, algorithms, quote unquote, let's say, um, these things are driven by real limitations, right? And understanding of the real world. So I'm gonna talk um, about uh, some large scale stuff in the real world. But I, I just wanna start very quickly with the notion um, that, you know, this may be where we start, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that the sketch is a gestural, um, a gestural uh, concept, right? In this case, what I'm showing is uh, a sketch of uh, an algorithm, let's call it, or, or a script, right? So how the relationships uh, or how the elements are related within something, right? And sometimes these things are driven by physical constraints. Sometimes they're design driven, uh, so they can be qualitative or quantitative, right? And so I'm gonna show you guys a bit of a case study of a, a couple of projects um, done before my time at HOK, one before, and then some stuff that we're doing at HOK. Uh, and, and not a lot of people would know that the sketch on the screen right now is actually what represents this building, right? Um, so this thing is about 100 meters long uh, by about 30 meters, let's say high, and 45 meters deep. Um, now what we're talking about right now is the wood screen that basically um, shrouds the um, stands, uh, south side stands. Uh, so this is Lansdowne Stadium in Ottawa and, and I've talked about this a number of times but I, I just I thought it was relevant in this conversation to talk about at a large scale when you've got a high number of elements how do you take the complexity out of you know putting the thing together and, and making each piece and putting the energy uh, a little bit into the upfront process of, uh, I guess we could call it design slash engineering. So, I mean, a lot of people are kind of familiar with this concept, right, of um, things being designed and driven by um, scripts. And, and, and again, the thing that I kind of want to stress is that um, the script is, is great as kind of a concept to gesturally explain um, a physical thing, um, but but the importance of actually understanding how these things work and what the materiality properties of the actual element itself are is just as important as the concept itself. So in this case, when it, the process was initially started, what we had was uh, we knew that this was going to be glue laminated timber, um, but basically what was happened was we had two end profiles lofted along or swept along a center line. Um, and that doesn't necessarily work because what happens is, is that the profile orients itself orthogonally to the line or the normal of the line, which means you actually get twisting, right, in the material. Now, it's one design gesture to say that you're gonna uh, use subtractive uh, milling and cut away to achieve that form. And it's another thing to say, no, actually what I'm trying to do is have straight timber pieces. I don't want any twisting to occur, right? So those are two different design strategies, but you could see if you didn't understand what you were doing and modeling up front, you'd have completely two different outcomes. And the people that would actually ultimate, ultimately review and price this thing, as David was saying, is that they're going to give you astronomical prices, right? So, so you have to optioneer um, well, I call it optioneering, it's not a real word, but, uh, you know, um, essentially you have to figure out what, what are some of the strategies you can deploy in order to actually uh, make this thing and, and save some money because everyone wants to see some uh, beautiful things made. It's just a matter of how can you actually achieve that. And so what I want to, uh, another uh, note actually I want to make is that, um, you know, a couple of times or in the last two talks, um, one of the 
kind of comments or a couple of comments that have been made is the fact that you know you design something and then you put it out to tender which is the typical architectural process and somebody basically gives you a value and says this is what i can make that for right now um obviously we kind of uh the the best sort of situation or scenario would be to be out in front of that and and understand how it's it's able to be made and what are some ways you can make it to help inform those people that are going to make it and give you a price I, I personally have um, had um, the amazing opportunity to be spoken to by the guys that are making the thing coming to me and saying, we really want to make this thing. And we know how to make things with our hands, but we don't know how to make things with machines. Can you find us a way to make it for this amount of money? And in this case, in Lansdowne Stadium, um, initial budgets were put out around seven and a half, eight million dollars. And the entire thing at the end of the day, deploying uh, parametric software, uh, digital, te um, digital fabrication technologies actually brought the thing down to 4.2 million. So this is what a fabrication model looks like for something that's 100 meters, meters long rather. Um, and, and the benefit of course to all of this is that you, know, you, you don't only see what's on the outside but you can see what's on the inside, right? As part of this process, everything is kind of interrelated. So with the benefit of tying elements together digitally, you actually know that when you modify certain material properties or curvatures that the elements that are embedded within that are also modified at the same time. So you're actually not modeling every piece, you're actually creating the relationships that you want. Um, which I think a lot of people tend to kind of gloss over the fact that you know a, shop, a set of shop drawings for some of the projects that you've seen already is actually way more complex than people give it credit for, right? Um, and so you wanna spend your time and invest it on modeling and not necessarily, particularly in the drawing and detailing of the thing, because if you can model and detail the thing and you know what the tolerances are for the equipment that's going to make it, then you can completely automate the entire drawing, drawing process, which is what we ended up doing on this building. So we had about a thousand sheets of drawings that, um, complete, uh, I would say 90% of them resolved themselves automatically, which means every night we ran essentially a bot um, that went in and went through all the views. We told it what we wanted our sheets to look like. We gave it sheet templates and we said, okay, pump these out overnight so that we didn't actually have to manually draw this. We invested our time in the things that mattered dealing with fabricators, um, working out machine tolerances, working out um, ways to get it on a truck. Um, so I think at the end of the day, I mean, this is kind of, uh, this was before we removed the cross bracing. You can see there's some temporary cross bracing in there, but there's a hell of a lot of precision involved in, uh, something at this scale when you're talking about cabling and routing and machining all of these elements. And the challenge is to say, you know, how can you actually not commoditize, but, um, reduce the complexity down to very few uh, customized solutions. And so, you know, the way that we did that is we had, you know, uh, 2,400 pieces of glue laminated uh, timber. Each of those ends had six unique compound cuts. No human is going to go through there and manually offset surfaces and start trimming away geometry. So you use scripting essentially to customize every piece. And if every piece is unique, uh, with six unique cuts on each end, you do the math. That's a lot of operations, right? Um, so what we basically worked out was we would provide the fabricator with a solid model. Um, they would load it into their, uh, in this case, we were actually able to get away with a three axis CNC machine. Um, and then they would pump them out the other end and we gave them an Excel spreadsheet with check dimensions. And we had, mm, out of 2,400 pieces, I don't know, maybe like a quarter of a percent there were issues with. So you're talking on a very large scale, uh, being able to do very sophisticated operations. And this is talking about like planing and embedding certain elements uh, to be able to uh, CNC through the material to receive bolts and rods. Um, so this is a structural lamb you can see here did this out west. Um, and, and what's really cool is that you know, in some instances, you might think that, oh, the scale of these things is so large that how would you ever be able to machine something that is, you know, 50 feet long? And the answer to that, of course, is a gantry CNC machine. I mean, who doesn't want one of those? Um, so you've got something that's like 10 feet tall that has infinite flexibility because if you want to create a larger piece, you li just lay down more track. 
um, and you can cut whatever the hell it is you want. And so it's really amazing. You would think that, you know, um, there are severe limitations, but these things exist, right? And you just need to know how they work in order to actually um, use them and design for them. So, you know, we did this uh, install through the dead of winter. There were some complications on some of the install, but it was basically just due to like pre-tensioning instead of post-tensioning. Uh, but you can see what the scale of these things are. And what's amazing is, is that you look at this guy on a little cherry picker there, pulling that thing in, leaning in to pull in that pin, which is no bigger than I would say uh, 100 mil, right? So four inches. Uh, and that's what holds those two things together in equilibrium. And then those, um, uh, we call them props on top. Um, and so there you can see, uh, I think total this probably took to assemble and install, install, not necessarily fabricate because, you know, the pieces came from Oregon, they came from Minnesota, they came from BC. Um, all in all, the install, I think, took around four, four-ish months, uh, which is pretty impressive for something of that scale. Uh, so here are just some gratuitous kind of details of various elements. And you can see it's quite a nice space to be in. Um, and I guess the last thing I'm, I'm, I'm probably we're running long for time. I'll, I'll jet right through this is, you know, part of my talk, I wanted to talk about, you know, what architecture is. Um, and if you think back to the times of uh, Leon uh, Battista Alberti, and even as recent as Mies, um, the idea of architecture as a craft is a really important thing, right? It's, it's a mechanical thing and it's an engineering based initiative, but it's also art, right? And so it's the fusing together of these elements um, that is so important. And so again, back to the act of actually making better art through the understanding of making, I just wanted to basically show some shots of, uh, this is just in St. Louis, downtown St. Louis, we've got a fabrication facility uh, at one of our offices and you can see the equipment list on the bottom right, that's just in St. Louis. And so all across HOK, we find it like really important um, to be able to make things and fab prefabricate them before as through part of the design process. So, you know, 3D printers, uh, laser cutters, mini CNC machines, three, five axis mini CNC machines. These are all kind of part of the process of investigating form and design and understanding how things go together, uh, albeit at a small scale. And so one of the projects I wanted to show you was, uh, it's a, um, not too dissimilar actually than the cladding project, um, Partisans project, uh, all we're talking about uh, ceiling here, um, where we had these um, compound formed um, ceiling panels in the lobby of a, a building in New York. And, you know, very similarly to the uh, stadium where processes usually surrounds optimization is cost driven. Um, we wanted to ensure that we could actually integrate mechanical and lighting and at the same time um, reduce the cost of unique panels. So you can see a little heat map here on the right, which shows um, kind of the density of the panels and the different types that we did a study on. Uh, and then again, the shop drawings that you can see were provided solid geometry in order to be able to make the things right so a fabricator could make it. Um, and see on the top left corner there, you can see the CNC machine kind of cutting the mold, um, which then of course the material was formed on uh, and then ultimately uh, installed. So um, there you can kind of get a sense of, you know, what the lobby looks like. And so we had two different types of panels. We call it like a positive and a negative where one was kind of uh, a, a void, a Boolean void from one part of the material. The other was like an extrusion. So it was the opposite, right? Uh, and how they fluctuated in the space. Um, and kind of, I uh, just, I'll talk quickly. I got a couple more, oh shoot, that advanced automatically, or you guys are maybe doing that for me. <laughs> um, but uh, so I did uh, solar glare, anal uh, glare analysis. We're using compute, oh geez, man, sorry guys. This is, uh, let me go back to that for a second very quickly. Um, solar glare analysis. Um, computationally to be able to study. Uh, we had a building in New York City downtown in Brooklyn actually and the client wanted the mechanical penthouse to be completely concealed so we put mirror panels on it and the city's concern was that by putting mirror panels on a mechanical penthouse we'd create uh, undue glare in uh, the urban environment which means that people driving cars would all of a sudden uh, start crashing into one another and people would start walking the cars which is a little bit crazy when you think about it. So we thought it was a little crazy too. So we ran uh, and used Ladybug and Honeybee to basically determine, uh, this is a little outside fabrication now, but we're just talking about computation, uh, to basically prove to the city that the points where you'd see the most glare would not actually affect anybody in the street. 
Um, and then so lastly, um, I'll just talk about, um, these are just some studies that we did. I'm gonna actually glaze over those, some more energy analysis, but I would really wanna kind of talk about uh, a couple more slides here. So um, when we're talking about, geez, it's doing it automatically again, Never mind. Um, when we're talking about um, kind of, you know, digital fabrication and research, um, inside HRK, we're also thinking about what are some kinds of materials and technologies we can embed that um, will allow us to kind of explore architecture in a new way. So what you're seeing here is actually a prototype that we've, uh, we worked on um, that you can actually find more information on our website about where we're thinking about, um, and obviously this is kind of pre-pandemic, but I've got a little video that I'll show you at the end about post-pandemic. Um, about how people experience sport events and um, and public events in general, right? And it's actually become more prescient now that, you know, um, as society, we've kind of got this, uh, we've got to stay socially distanced from one another. And the idea is, you know, how can technology help enhance the experience of those spaces? And so what we've started doing is, and this might give people, some people a lot of anxiety to see that many people next to each other. Uh, but the idea is that how can you explore these spaces using things that traditionally would be blank slates that are things that don't actually create any value or ex in the experience and turn those into interactive displays. So for instance, the field in a, on a rugby pitch, um, what if that were to, uh, the players were to be wearing, you know, GPS detectors that could detect the impact or the G-force of the contact and that could be displayed on the field itself or different viewpoints where you're actually hung over the field, looking over the field, um, you're on a bridge looking down, watching the play. Um, so these are some of the things that we use computationally to kind of study uh, and with our understanding of actually the mechanics structurally, how things operate and testing that. Um, these are the sorts of things that we kind of explore. Um, and lastly, I just want to, I'll just show a quick video here uh, and then I'm done. I'm sorry, guys, I've, I've run long. I don't know if you guys can hear the sound at all. So um, I just wanted to leave it at that to say that um, we use it to kind of explore how to make things, how to understand, you know, how we can actually get people back into safe places together uh, from enough, uh, a number of very varying points of perspective. Um, and that's all. <laughs>